Good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Zulimo Skanga, and I'm the Support Center Manager for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. We'd like to thank you for joining AFA's webinar, Asthma and Climate Change, Myths and Misconceptions. We have a great program for you today. Our speakers are Stacey Denham, Public Health Manager, and Jessica Jackson, Asthma and Respiratory Health Program Manager. Stacey, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Zulima. Before we dive in, I would like to tell you a little, about, a little bit about AFA and who we are. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation aims to be a trusted ally of the asthma and allergy communities. We are dedicated to saving lives and reducing the burden of these diseases through support, education, advocacy, and research. Without you, our community, we wouldn't be here today. So thank you for everything you do for those everywhere with asthma and allergies. Now, before we begin, let's go over a few house rules. Everyone's video and audio are on mute. If you have questions, please type them into the chat box that you see on your screen. All questions will be received through our chat and will be answered at the end of the presentation. So please ask as many as you would like. There will be resources posted in the chat as well. And yes, this webinar will be recorded and sent out via email to all who registered within the next week. So with those house rules spoken, let me talk a little bit about who we are personally. My name is Stacy, and I am the public health manager here at AFA. You just heard from Zulima, our colleague, who is our support center manager. She makes sure everything on the back end runs smoothly during today's webinar. And she's also going to moderate our Q&A portion of today's program towards the end of the program. Jessica and I will be co-hosting today's program, and we would like to share a little bit about who we are and what we do. So my background is in social work and public health, and I've worked in asthma education and public health, community health, for a little over 20 years. A little fun fact about me is I'm from New Orleans and I have most recently volunteered with a local organization to plant marsh grass on the Louisiana coast to help restore our coastline. So that's a little fun fact and I'd like to hand the program over to Jessica so she can share a little bit about herself and start us off. All right. Thanks, Stacey. Hi, everybody. So my name is Jessica. I have a background in respiratory therapy, asthma education, and epidemiology. I have about 14 years of combined experience in healthcare and public health, and I recently joined the AFA team back in February, and I'm very excited to be here, and I'm looking forward to talking with you all a little bit more about asthma and climate change today. So today we will be discussing asthma and climate change. Uh, more specifically, we'll be dispelling some myths and misconceptions around how climate change impacts asthma. So first, we'll give a broad overview on what asthma is. We'll discuss the disparities that contribute to it, and then we'll dive into climate change and its main drivers. We'll then move on to tackle some myths around the impact the environment has on asthma, and then we'll talk about some ways to take action. And finally, we'll wrap up with a quick Q&A. So before we move on to talk more about climate change and how it impacts asthma, we'd like to give a brief overview of the burden of asthma in the United States, discuss what asthma is, what triggers it, and also how it's treated. So asthma is a chronic lung disease that affects both children and adults. It's the most common chronic disease among children aside from dental caries. And asthma, what it is, it's an inflammation and a narrowing of the small airways in the lungs. And this inflammation and narrowing causes asthma symptoms, which can be any combination of cough, wheeze, shortness of breath, and chest tightness or pain. So there's no cure for asthma, but it can be controlled with medications. And when these medications are used correctly as prescribed, most people with asthma can lead healthy, active lives. So with asthma, there are three main changes that take place in the airways. They include swelling and excess mucus production inside the airways, along with bronchoconstriction, which is when the muscles that are wrapped around the airways spasm or tighten. So the underlying or root cause of asthma is actually the inflammation and the excess mucus production. 
And not only does this create a smaller space for breathing in and out, but when there's swelling and overproduction of mucus inside the airways, it makes them hypersensitive. And when they're hypersensitive, this causes the muscles that are wrapped around them to spasm or constrict. And all of this together causes the asthma symptoms that were previously noted. So people with asthma have airways that are sensitive to certain things that might not bother people who don't have asthma. And these things are called triggers and they do vary from person to person. And when a person with asthma is exposed to something they're sensitive to, this triggers an inflammatory response in the lungs and leads to asthma symptoms. So examples of common triggers include allergens like pollen, dust, mold, animal dander. Uh, triggers can also be irritants like smoke, chemicals, perfumes. Other triggers include respiratory illnesses like colds or the flu, or strong emotions, exercise, weather changes, or extreme weather, and GERD or acid reflux. Other less common triggers include foods, uh, especially those that contain sulfites, and then certain medications like NSAIDs and beta blockers can also trigger asthma in some people. So it's important for asthma patients to avoid their triggers by adopting multi-component strategies. Exercise is somewhat of an exception to this in the sense that it, it shouldn't necessarily be avoided. Usually providers will have asthma patients with exercise-induced bronchoconstriction pre-treat with medicine about five to 10 minutes prior to exercise or playing sports. There are many medications that can treat asthma. They're divided into three main categories. The first category are controller medications, which address the underlying cause of asthma in the sense that they decrease the swelling and overproduction of mucus inside the airways. And they do this slowly over a long period of time. And they're often prescribed as a daily treatment. The second category of medication is quick relief medicines. Uh, quick relief medications do not address the underlying issue, so they don't really do a whole lot for the swelling and overproduction of mucus in the airways. However, they do relax the muscles that are wrapped around the airways. And when these muscles relax, it pulls the airways open, so there's a bigger space to breathe in and out. And other symptoms like coughing, wheezing, and chest tightness are temporarily alleviated as well. They're used as needed. They tend to work really quickly to relieve sudden symptoms, but their effects don't last very long. It's, it's somewhat dependent on the individual, but typically it lasts about four to six hours. And then finally, the third category of medication are combination medications that aim to control and relieve. And this brings us to the concept of smart therapy, which we'll discuss in more detail on the next slide. So SMART stands for Single Maintenance and Reliever Therapy. It's a controller and a quick relief medicine combined into one inhaler. And the current asthma management guidelines recommend a long-acting beta agonist called Fomoterol to be used in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid called budesonide for SMART. So this combination is found in an inhaler called Symbacort. And inhaled corticosteroids like those found in Symbacort supplement the natural corticosteroids that are made by your body's adrenal glands. They're a very low dose and they target the airways specifically, which means that they tend to work pretty well and the risk of side effects is relatively low. For Motorol, on the other hand, acts quickly to relax the muscles around the airways and this opens up the airways and relieves sudden symptoms. Fomoterol also keeps the airways open for a long period of time, uh, usually up to about 12 hours. So Symbacort, it's not the only option for SMART. Uh, some providers prefer to prescribe an inhaler called Delura. And Delura is a combination of Fomoterol and an inhaled corticosteroid called Mimetazone Furate. So as of April 2023, the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA actually has not yet approved these medicines to be used in this way. So unfortunately, some patients may encounter challenges with their insurance coverage. But thankfully, some payers have add, added Simbacort and Delura to their preferred drug lists, and they will approve their use for SMART uh, without prior authorization. It is worth noting, though, that many pharmacy benefit managers will also impose strict quantity limits that might actually fall below the maximum daily adult dose. And with that, I'll pass it back to Stacy, who will talk a little bit more about asthma and health disparities. Thanks so much, Jessica. Let's talk about health disparities. And when you talk about a disease like asthma, we have to remember that there are differences or health disparities with asthma that disproportionately affect Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous communities. Knowing this fact helps to shape how we approach healthcare in all communities, ensuring that everyone has equitable access to the healthcare that they want 
that they need and that they deserve. And when we talk about health disparities, we're talking about differences in health that exist based on factors like your race, ethnicity, age, gender, where you live, your citizenship status, and more. Health disparities can include a lot of things. And a lot of times we look at things like mortality, which is the rate at which death occurs or how someone dies um, at, in certain conditions. And we look at life expectancy, how long someone is expected to live. The burden of disease is how heavy the disease falls on a population and whether you are insured or uninsured and you have access to care, all of these characteristics affect your health care and your care. And all of these are health disparities. Within that, asthma is a common example of a condition that affects one group of people differently than another group of people. Treatment includes improving access to high quality asthma health care, education in a way that each person can understand it, access it, use it in the way that they want to receive it. Further, if you look at the burden of asthma in the United States, you will find that it falls disproportionately on Black, Hispanic, and American Indian and Alaska Native people. These groups have the highest asthma rates, hospital visits, and deaths. And I think this slide is a really great visual representation of what this looks like. And we can talk about numbers all day, but to see the numbers and look at them and really break it down is really a heavy burden um, and an ask uh, for all of us. And so I think this pairs very nicely with the mission and the goals that AFA sets forward in helping to reduce those disparities and the work that we do in improving that access to healthcare across the board. So understanding the root causes of asthma disparities can help us to understand asthma outcomes. And when you break it down even further, you can find the reasons why some communities might have uncontrolled or controlled asthma, whether they adhere or don't adhere to medication, experience more exacerbations or less exacerbations as a result of environmental triggers. It's important to remember that each one of these root causes influences the whole. Take, for example, where you live, eat, where you work, where you play, especially our children. Schools serving minority and socially disadvantaged children were more likely to be located near a major roadway. This location directly impacts a child's health outcome, specifically if they have respiratory illness or things like asthma. So a person's physical and social environment directly influences their asthma outcomes, which is why today's discussion about climate change is so important. So when we discuss climate change, we're looking at a few factors that in, can, can impact infectious disease, cardiovascular disease, and especially why we're here today, asthma and allergies. Breaking it down even further, climate change refers to the long-term changes in temperature and weather patterns. There are natural variations, such as the solar cycle, which contributes to these shifts, right? But Human activities have been the primary driver of climate change since the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. This is mainly due to the burning of fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and gas. And ground level ozone is a major part of urban smog. More air pollution and smog can cause higher levels of CO2 or carbon dioxide that results in warmer temperatures, and thus the cycle continues. We also wanna point out that deforestation and large scale agriculture is a contributor to climate change as well. And we're gonna address this in some further slides coming up. The burning of fossil fuels generates greenhouse gas emissions, and these emissions create a blanket effect that traps the sun's heat and raises temperatures. The predominant gas that contributes to this climate change is carbon dioxide. CO2 is released from gasoline in cars, from burning coal, heating buildings, and like we said previously, deforestation or large-scale agriculture. 
Another gas that contributes to climate change is methane. Um, methane is released from garbage in landfills, agriculture, land use, transport, energy use, and industrial activities. And as these emissions continues to rise, remember the planet is getting warmer. The Earth is about 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer now than it was in the 1800s. And if you look back to 2011 to 2020, this was the warmest decade on record. So there are the statistics there that show that the world is getting warmer. Gas concentrations are at the highest level in the last 2 million years. And when we look further into the data, we find that 10% 10 per, 10 of emissions come from wasted food. The food system accounts for a third of greenhouse gas emissions and 30% of the world's energy consumption, most of which are fossil fuels. And if you break those fuels down even further, we will find that 75% of these emissions are animal-based food, which accounts for that. So it's quite a lot um, going on there. Like we discussed, the predominant gas that contributes to climate change is carbon dioxide. CO2 is released, like we said, from gasoline in cars, coal, heating buildings, clearing those lands and forests, such as deforestation. And another gas that contributes to climate change is methane. Methane is released from garbage in the landfills. It's released from agriculture. If you think about uh, farming, if you think about cattle farms, it's released in land use, transportation, energy, and industrial activities. Further down the line is nitrous oxide, which is released from fertilizer, waste products, and even the production of fabrics like nylon. But when you look at it, soil management is the main source of nitrous oxide, which has 300 times the impact of carbon dioxide. Fluorinated gases are also produced from a variety of household, commercial and industrial processes. Now, when we take all of this into account, we have to remember that the more these emissions are released, the more these gases go on, the planet continues to get warmer. Climate change impacts many, many things, including health, housing, work, and the ability to grow food. Some people are more susceptible to the consequences of climate change, such, such as those with vulnerable illnesses, uh, such as asthma and respiratory illnesses. This is especially true for those who live in island nations, developing countries and urban areas. Even entire communities on some island nations have had to relocate due to the rising sea levels and saltwater intrusion. Long-term droughts have also put people at a risk of famine as well. So taking all of this into account and looking at allergy and asthma across the continental U United States, you can find health inc outcomes are influenced by the climate, but you can also find that they're influenced where you live. So the Asthma and Allergy Foundation, or AFA, has produced Allergy Capitals, which is a report that has come out since 2003 to help people recognize, prevent, and manage seasonal allergies. Since that first report, 2003, seasonal allergies have in fact worsened. Climate change has caused the growing seasons to get longer and warmer, leading to higher tree, grass, and weed pollen counts. Some parts of the United States have pollen now year round. The warmer temperatures are also getting trapped in urban areas, which directly impact air pollution. And we're gonna talk about that in a slide right after this. And the 2023 Allergy Capitals report uses the data from the previous year to rank how challenging it is to live with pollen allergies in the 100 largest cities in the continental United States. So the report looks at five factors. This is how we break it down and take it into account. We look at five things, tree, grass, and weed pollen scores, over-the-counter allergy medicine use, and the availability of board-certified allergists and immunologists in your area. 
So taking into account all those factors, looking at all the cities across the continental United States, we've come up with the number one allergy capital, which is based on all of those pollen scores, over-the-counter allergy medicine use, and the number of allergy specialists. And your number one allergy capital for 2023 is Wichita, Kansas. So that was our allergy and asthma capitals. And in reference to that, we discussed uh, urban, urban heat islands, right? Many of the health impacts of climate change are felt more in urban centers. Warmer temperatures, extreme heat waves are made worse in urban areas due to an effect called an urban heat island. And I really like this picture because it shows the temperature during the day and how much it increases but most importantly, too, it shows the temperature of an area, urban area at night and how that temperature is sustained. And there's really no drop in the temperature, but just an increase and a rise in the temperature. So an area really doesn't get any relief. That heat just keeps increasing. So warmer temperatures and extreme heat waves are made worse in these areas. And an urban heat island is a metropolitan area that has higher temperatures than its surrounding areas. So think of a metropolitan city, think of places like New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, even places like Cincinnati or Miami even. Buildings, roads, infrastructure, population density, and a lack of green space can make cities feel several degrees warmer than nearby rural areas. And climate change is expected to intensify the urban heat island effect. Extreme heat made worse by these urban heat islands increases air pollution and can really increase your allergic sensitivity. Further, carbon dioxide pollution from vehicles, power plants, and industry in cities can be very high and can impact pollen production. One study on ragweed pollen even found that it can be seven times higher in a city that averaged 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit warmer and had 30% more CO2 than the city's rural surrounding area. So with that breakdown of climate change, I'm gonna pass this over to Jessica to talk more about its effects on asthma. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. So not surprisingly, people with asthma are at greater risk of poor health outcomes related to climate change. And this is because climate change increases the presence of air pollution, allergens, wildfires, extreme weather events, mold, and toxic chemicals. And these are all potential triggers that can increase the risk of either developing asthma or having an asthma exacerbation. So we'll talk first about air pollution. Uh, air pollution can trigger asthma attacks in people who already have this condition. Uh, additionally, kids who are exposed to higher levels of air pollution are more likely to develop asthma. So essentially, climate change promotes higher temperatures, which enhances the presence of particulate matter, or PM, and something called ground-level ozone. So ozone is especially abrasive, and it actually acts like a sunburn on the lungs. So it's a very potent irritant that can cause an asthma episode. And as Stacy mentioned earlier, she alluded to the urban heat island effect. So essentially urban areas pose the greatest health risk for people who have asthma. And this is because of the urban heat island effect, which increases pollen production and air pollution. And multiple forms of air pollution like ozone, PM, diesel exhaust particles, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide increase the permeability of the respiratory tract. And these forms of pollution allow allergens and irritants to move more easily into the mucous membranes and cause interactions with the cells of the immune system. So in other words, air pollution plays an inflammatory role in the airways with people um, who have asthma. Warmer temperatures also lead to longer pollen seasons and cause plants to produce more pollen for longer periods of time. And this is largely due to the carbon dioxide rich air, which results from climate change. And interestingly, warmer temperatures between 1995 and 2011 caused the pollen season to be about 11 to 27 days longer than usual. Changing wind patterns are a concern as well in the sense that they allow for the long distance transport of pollens. And additionally, environmental pollutants not only irritate the skin and mucous membranes, but they alter allergen carriers like pollen to release allergen-containing aerosols in ambient air. And pollen is both an allergic carrier and it also releases active pollen-associated lipid mediators that cause inflammation and immunomodulating effects in allergic diseases. 
So wildfires are also happening more frequently in the United States and they're more intense. Uh, wildfire smoke contains particle pollution and particle pollution is comprised of tiny particles that can travel through the lungs and into the bloodstream. And this causes a number of health issues like asthma episodes. It can also cause heart attacks, lung cancer, and even early death. Uh, unknown exposure to these particles is a growing issue as well, and this is because the wind can carry particle pollution thousands of miles away from the actual fire. Extreme weather events like droughts, floods, and violent storms are also occurring more frequently because of climate change, and events like severe thunderstorms can create pollen bursts or increased dust particles in the air, both of which can trigger asthma, and floods can lead to increased mold growth and disrupted polar vortex events bring blasts of cold air to latitudes further south than normal, which can expose people with asthma to cold air that can affect the airways. And many ex extreme weather events, they force people to evacuate and sometimes even lose their homes altogether. And these evacuations, they, they cause major disruptions in general, but they're especially disruptive to asthma management in the sense that some people might end up leaving behind medications or lose communication with their healthcare providers altogether. So storms, uh, they often cause significant damage to homes and buildings, and repairing flooded homes and burning the debris from gutted buildings can expose people to mold and toxic chemicals. And this exposure is particularly dangerous for people who have asthma and other respiratory diseases. The risk of environmental health hazards or exposure to them depends greatly on where you live. Uh, for instance, some communities such as low income or communities of color are more likely to reside in neighborhoods that were founded on racial segregation or other forms of environmental injustices. And many economically disadvantages, disadvantaged communities are in close proximity to industrial and hazardous waste sites. And an example of this is Gordon Plaza, which it's a neighborhood in New Orleans that was built for low income families on top of a landfill. And it's now a designated toxic Superfund site. And these sites, they release toxins and contaminants that disproportionately burden those in surrounding neighborhoods. And this increases exposure to environmental health hazards, which enhances the risk of poor health outcomes. And climate change increases both the risk of exposure and magnifies the health impact of environmental pollutants. And unfortunately, as noted, low-income communities and urban areas are disproportionately affected by this. And of particular concern is the impact that this and climate change in general has on asthma, both in children and in adults. And now I'll, I'll pass it back to Stacy, who's gonna start us off with some myths and misconceptions about asthma and climate change. Thanks so much, Jessica. So let's talk a little bit about a few common misconceptions about climate change and asthma. So climate change and global warming are two terms that are often used interchangeably, but they're not synonymous. Global warming is only one component of climate change and it refers to the rise in global temperatures from the ever rising concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And climate change refers to the increasing changes in the measure of climate over a long period of time. This includes things like precipitation, temperature, and wind patterns. Myth number two, that reduced CO2 emissions will immediately reverse climate change. These reduced CO2 emissions will stabilize atmospheric concentrations. The surface air temperatures will continue to rise for another century, and ground level particles and the ozone will increase. Myth number three, uh, climate change does not mean that the Earth's temperature will just rise. This is only a part of climate change's impact. It is an overall shift in climate patterns that includes a lot of different extreme weather events. It's also important to remember that the Earth is connected. What happens in one place influences change in another. Myth number four, the concentration of carbon dioxide has risen in the atmosphere, which has enhanced the Earth's natural greenhouse effect. This is largely due to human activities. Remember those greenhouse emissions, partly due to natural solar systems, but also largely due to uh, human activities as a major driver. According to NOAA's Global Monitoring Division, since the Industrial Revolution, CO2 grew by over 2.87 parts 
per million. It was at 280 parts per million in 1870, and in 2019, it's at 409.92 parts per million, and that is a striking contrast and difference. Myth number five, this varies by region and it depends greatly on latitude, altitude, rainfall, storms, land use, urbanization, and energy production. So the myth that climate change does not make my allergies and asthma worse, we have seen longer and warmer, more intense allergy seasons that are increased triggers and caused by climate change. There are higher concentrations of pollen that are leaked to, linked to CO2, and longer growing seasons have increased exposure to allergens that trigger asthma and other respiratory and allergic responses. I'm gonna hand the myth number six over to Jessica. All right, thanks Stacey. So myth number six is that asthma inhalers are causing climate change and shouldn't be used. Well, in 2009, the FDA banned the use of chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs in inhalers, and the CFC propellants were replaced by hydrofluoroalkanes or HFA propellants. And these HFA products, they are carbon-based and they do contribute to greenhouse gases, but they do not deplete ozone. They're also only found in metered dose inhalers or MDIs, and you will not find them in other types of inhalers like dry powdered inhalers or soft mist inhalers. Um, for some patients, an MDI is the most effective treatment option. And for patients who do need MDI inhalers to control their asthma, uh, they can actually focus on other ways to reduce their climate impact, such as changing their mode of transportation or the way they heat their home, uh, their diet, et cetera. Um, however, it's Im important to note that the most effective interventions will come from large scale policy changes and corporate responsibility. And this is because corporations tend to have a much larger impact on, on climate change than individuals. So fortunately, there are some steps you can take to minimize the impact of climate change on asthma. So first, you can visit the National Allergy Bureau at aaai.org slash NAB for pollen count information. You can also visit airnow.gov for Environmental Protection Agency or EPA air quality alerts. Uh, both of these websites also have apps available for smartphones and tablets. And when you go to these sites, you can check local air pollution levels and pollen counts. And if one or both are high, uh, try to avoid spending a lot of time outdoors and certainly avoid participating in vigorous outdoor activities. So other things you can do include avoiding spending a lot of time outside near high tra traffic areas if possible, uh, avoid smoking, using e-cigarettes, burning incense, or really burning anything else in and around your home uh, unless you're using a well-ventilated stove or fireplace. Additionally, consider using EPA Safe Choice cleaning products, consider purchasing an asthma and allergy certified air filter, air cleaner, or air purifier. Uh, you can work with local health officials to properly clean flooded homes, and then certainly be sure to follow your asthma action plan, and be sure to tell your provider if your asthma does happen to worsen. So there are also steps you can take to minimize your impact on climate change itself. And the first is using less energy in your home. So electricity and other energy sources create air pollution and you can improve air quality and lower greenhouse gas emissions by reducing your energy use. I, I added bonus, it will also help you save a little bit of money, which is always nice. Uh, other major sources of air pollution are burning trash and firewood. Uh, so doing this releases particle pollution or soot, which that can cause some major health problems. Um, so some homes do rely only on wood burning for heat. And if a home can't convert to other sources of heat, the EPA does have a list of certified wood heaters that can be installed. Um, allowing bu buses to idle is another source of pollution. So schools should try to keep exhaust levels down by not allowing school buses to idle in front of the building. A lot of school systems have implemented the EPA's Clean School Bus Campaign, which prohibits this. And we definitely encourage you to support this campaign in your local school, school districts as well. And other things you can do, uh, you can plant trees and vegetation in your neighborhood and do your best to reduce waste, recycle, and reuse. 
So how, how do we fix the overall issue of climate change and its impact on people with asthma and allergies? Well, laws created to reduce emissions and air pollution can make a really big difference. And we do need policymakers to act now to slow down climate change and reduce its impact on human health and combat environmental injustice. So we encourage you to join AFA at afa.org slash join and follow our blog for advocacy action alerts, where we offer, offer simple ways to contact your representatives to encourage them to act on issues that are important to the health of people with allergies and asthma. And now I'll pass it back to Stacy to talk a little bit about some AFA resources. Yeah, thanks so much, Jessica. I've learned so much from you today, and I've so much enjoyed talking with you about um, the effects of climate change on asthma and the effect of your asthma on climate change as well. You're such a source of information, and I greatly appreciate sharing your wisdom with that. Um, and I want to thank the audience as well for participating with us throughout this pre presentation. And before we jump in, I want to share a few resources with you. AFA offers educational materials and tools for patients of all ages. Some are available in Spanish, and you can browse our online store for free educational materials about asthma and allergies. Our support center is available Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, except on U.S. holidays. Please allow two business days for a response. And if you don't have access to a phone or a computer, you can call our toll-free number for more information, 1-800-727-8462. And that number will bring you straight to the support center. And you can ask any question um, that you might have about asthma or allergies. We also want to share a little bit about our online communities. And by viewing those sites listed on the screen, you can join one of our online communities for asthma and allergy support or even food allergy support to connect with other members managing the same conditions. Our online communities are available 24-7 and are moderated by experienced staff. Also, AFA has a learning catalog filled with online courses and resources about asthma, allergies, and food allergies for patients, families, healthcare providers, educators, and caregivers. A whole list of things for anyone looking to um, broaden their insight in their library. The courses are self-paced, so you can move through the lessons at your own convenience. Our Ask the Allergist resource is phenomenal. This is one of my favorite resources. If you have a question about an allergy or about asthma, whether it's food allergy or a seasonal allergy, you can submit your question to our allergist. You can search AFA's Ask the Allergist knowledge base for answers to many common questions about asthma and allergies. allergies. Our board certified allergists answer general questions about managing asthma or allergies, medicines, and treatment. Now remember, Ask the Allergist does not answer questions about specific consumer products, and it is not a substitute for medical advice from your physician. But if you do have a question that you've always wanted to ask and you don't have anyone to ask it to, now is your time and you can phone in to Ask the Allergist. Lastly, our certified program is a really great program that has products that have met our standards and earned the asthma certified certification. And it also tells you where to buy these products. So product, these are products and things for your home, things like air filters, um, vacuums, mattress covers and pads, things to improve the air quality in your home and in, even inside and outside. So I would definitely take a look at that certified program to find more more about what it offers and it can steer you to products and um, things if you're looking to improve the air quality in your home. And Jessica is going to go into a little bit more detail on some further resources that we've discussed throughout this presentation. Yeah, thanks Stacey. So yeah, lastly, we just want to leave you with a few sources. Uh, and just here where many of these were used to compile this presentation and some of them such as the climate central report our chief medical officer actually has contributed to so we just invite you to look through and use these resources as tools for your practice um, and that essentially concludes our presentation and i just wanted to thank you stacy thank you zalima thank you to the audience for your participation uh, it was 
wonderful speaking with you today. And now I'd like to pass it back to Salima for a quick Q&A session. Thank you so much, Stacy and Jessica, for all the valuable information that you've shared today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, as Jessica said, we'll now move forward to our question and answer session. Our first question is, what are some action steps I can take to advocate for my child with allergies and asthma? Absolutely, that's a wonderful question. Um, we would absolutely advise you to support policies that protect uh, asthma and allergy health. You can join AFA at afa.org backslash join. If you're interested in advocating or joining in the advocacy effort, you can follow our blog or social media for any advocacy action alerts. We offer simple ways to contact your representatives to encourage them to act on issues important to the health of people with allergies and asthma. Remember, little steps make a big difference, and that's how we're going to affect change. Keep calling your representative, keep showing up at their office, go as a group, bring AFA resources and materials as a leave behind for them. And um, be sure to join our efforts at afa.org backslash join. Our next question is, what are some actions I can take to control my asthma exacerbations when the air quality and weather make my asthma worse? Yeah, so I can answer this one. This is also a really good question. Uh, the first, I would say, uh, kind of like we mentioned on the slide, avoid try to avoid spending time outdoors and participating in vigorous outdoor activity in extreme weather or also if the air quality is bad or the pollen counts are high. I know sometimes that's not possible, so if you can't avoid spending time outdoors, uh, you might want to consider wearing a mask. Uh, this can help trap pollens and debris. It also will naturally warm and humidify the air you breathe in, and this can be especially helpful if it's very cold and dry outside and you're somebody who's sensitive to cold, dry air. Uh, also, if you can't avoid spending time outdoors and it is a high pollen count day and you're someone who's sensitive to pollens, uh, be sure to change your clothes and put them in the wash and then shower and wash your hair immediately after coming inside. Uh, and this is because pollens, they can stick to your clothes and your hair and they can prolong your exposure to them. And similarly, you might want to keep your windows closed if it's a high pollen count day or bad air pollution day. Um, open windows allow for pollen, dust, and debris to blow inside your home, which will also prolong your exposure. And if extreme heat is the issue, uh, do your best to remain in an air conditioning building. If you don't have air conditioning at your home, uh, you might want to consider going to an air conditioned store, restaurant, or even a movie during the hottest part of the day. Uh, and then finally, you might want to consider some of the certified asthma and allergy products we noted, briefly noted earlier, like the air cleaners, the filters, and the purifiers. Our next question is, are there products that can help improve my home air quality? Where can I find them? I'll take that one. <laughs> That's a great question. And the answer is yes, there are. There are products such as air cleaners that can help reduce allergen from the airs and monitor allergen levels. And some even monitor ozone levels. HVAC air filters also help with ventilation and some have the capacity to remove allergens and irritants from the airflow. Dehumidifiers is also an example of a product that can improve air quality. They can help with dust mites and molds. They are known to help improve indoor air quality. And if you're looking for something for your entire home, you can also look into a whole air cleaner. This is an air cleaning device that is designed to be installed in the ductwork of houses that can improve or affect the air of the entire home. Now, that may be a little bit more than a product, a little product you're, or a little improvement you're looking to make, but definitely something that can improve uh, the entire quality of your home. It's important to remember that many products promise to help control allergens and to help you make informed decisions AFA has several certified products. When you are shopping for products in your home, look for the certified asthma and allergy friendly mark. This indicates that the product has passed our testing standards. And to find more information, such as a visual on that mark or what products are out there, visit afa.org 
backslash certified to search for certified products. They can also help you learn more about the asthma and allergy friendly certification program. Our next question is, springtime makes my allergies and asthma worse. Is there a plan I can follow to improve my symptoms? Yeah, so I'll take this one, and this is also a really good question. Uh, so put, put simply, it boils down to knowing what your triggers are and implementing multi-component strategies to avoid them, uh, and also taking your asthma medication correctly as prescribed. Um, but I also would encourage you to speak to your, your healthcare provider, you know, bring or request an asthma action plan so you can go over it together and know the steps that you can take to help prevent exacerbations or symptoms. Uh, this plan, it can help you identify what your triggers are and some ways to avoid them. It can also help you identify which medication medications to take and when. Additionally, you might want to ask your provider about a spacer or valve holding chamber. Uh, so if you use a meter dose inhaler, these devices can actually help more medication get into your lungs. And when they when more gets into your lungs, they, they more or less work better. Uh, it also has fewer side effects. But with a valve holding chamber or spacer device, you may actually see a greater improvement in your symptoms. Our next question is, what can I do to make an impact on climate change in a positive way? I'll take this one. Um, there are lots of things that you can do to help slow and lessen climate change. Remember, little steps add up to big changes, so keep making a difference. And I'll harken back to this couple of slides we had prior. You can use less energy in your home. Remember, electricity and other energy sources create air pollution. So you can improve the air quality and lower greenhouse gas emissions by reducing your energy use. And this will also help save you money in the long run. You can also use public transit or walk. You can bike to work or you can carpool. Um, some other things, don't burn wood, especially during bans, and don't burn trash. Other major sources of air pollution are burning trash and firewood. So doing this releases particle pollution or soot, which we discussed, which can cause major health problems. And remember, if a home can't convert to electrical sources of heat, the EPA has a list of certified wood heaters. We also discussed uh, supporting the EPA's Clean School Bus campaign. And one of my favorite things to do is plant trees or vegetation in your neighborhood. Remember our discussion about urban heat islands? Well, planting trees is a tiny action that can help make a big difference. Get together with your neighborhood, your civic association, your HOA, and assess whether you can plant trees or vegetation to help impact climate change in a positive way in your community. And then of course, something small we can do every single day, we can reduce waste, we can recycle, and we can reuse. Sulima, so I'll hand it over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. On behalf of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, we'd like to thank you for participating in today's webinar. We greatly appreciate your time and spending your morning or afternoon with us. Uh, with that, uh, this concludes our webinar and thank you again for uh, joining us today. Have a great day, everyone.